Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Connect to Car roundtable discussion entitled Privacy and Customer Acceptance of Data Monetization. Your moderator is Jeff Plungis from Consumer Reports. You are invited to submit questions for today's roundtable through the SAE International's WCX app. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Plungis. Uh, thank you and good morning. And I, I am Jeff Plungis. And uh, we are here to, today to talk about uh, card data and how it's evolving and um, all of the, the uses that are getting underway. Uh, so I'm just gonna say a few words and then we're gonna go around and introduce the panel. Um, so if you believe some of the predictions about the ways companies are going to be making money off of CARS data, we're in for some big changes. There's an assumption in the auto industry that consumers are comfortable with all the ways they've been giving away their smartphone data or their social media information, and that the same will be true for cars. At Consumer Reports, we're not so sure. Consumer Reports is known for things like uh, testing toasters and refrigerators, and we still do that. Uh, we're also known for our unbiased evaluations of cars where we buy every vehicle we review anonymously from an actual dealer. So we're getting a typical car or truck that any consumer would buy, not a pristine press car. And we put those vehicles through the paces at our privately owned test track. But more and more, we as an organization are worried about the quality of our digital lives. Consumer Reports was part of a coalition that created something called the Digital Standard. And this is an open source set of principles to evaluate responsible handling of consumer data. It's kind of like an SAE standard without the automotive engineers. Uh, we're using it to evaluate products and services and how well they're treating consumers. In one of its first applications, CR used the Digital Standard to evaluate smart TVs last year and the results were startling. We found that TVs could be hacked using rudimentary skills and they could be taken over remotely. Hackers could control the picture, the audio, the channels. It was like, if you're old enough to remember this, it was like the opening of the Outer Limits TV show. <laughs> uh, and if, if you're my age, you might get that reference and apologies if you don't. But more disturbingly, our testing showed that the TV manufacturers we're using their smart TVs to vacuum up enormous amounts of information about what their customers were viewing without disclosing it or offering any benefit to the TV owner. We've also used the digital standard to evaluate things like online payment apps, and within the next year or so, we'll be looking at the way cars handle personal data. So, what about cars? We have a distinguished panel today that will help us begin to figure that out. So on today's panel, we have, uh, from my left, Charles Egan, the Chief Technology Officer of BlackBerry. Um, Doug Betts, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Global Automotive at J.D. Power. Carlin Stanley, a lawyer. She's a lawyer and a Senior Policy Analyst with the Rand Corporation. Uh, Gal Burkhotes who is the uh, Vice President of Data Analytics and Monetization at ZF, and Ellen Partridge, uh, Policy and Strategy Director at the Shared Use Mobility Center. So uh, the first thing we're gonna do is ask each panelist to just speak for one or two minutes about uh, what their company or organization uh, does broadly and, and its interest in uh, automotive data. So I'll start with Charles. Great, thanks Jeff. My name is Charles Egan. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at BlackBerry. Uh, BlackBerry has been through several uh, evolutionary steps in recent years, so I'll just uh, give a, a clear picture of what our current focus is. We've kind of migrated to be a security software company. We spent a lot of years doing secure communications and uh, protecting communications and privacy in the mobile handset business uh, globally. Um, 
We've, we're taking that technology to move forward to help protect the connected world. We have a great footprint with the BlackBerry QNX in the automotive, uh, in the automotive space that's used. We have a secu uh, secure OS that's used widely with automotive OEMs. And we have a number of other service technologies or technologies that can be used for providing security and privacy in a connected automobile. So I'm really looking forward to discussing some of the data and privacy issues today on the panel. I'm Doug Batts, I'm the global head of the auto division at J.P. Power. Um, we are uh, most well known for the studies that we do on both uh, service quality for people buying or getting a vehicle service. Doug, can uh, people hear Doug? Okay. All right, so. so say that they need to turn on number eight, because I originally yeah. had number three. Uh, so technical people, please turn on number eight. Uh, but why don't, we, why don't we skip yeah. you and, and go to Carlin? Sure, we'll come back. sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Carlin Stanley from Rand Corporation. And what I'd like to talk about today are three key pieces of research that we've been focusing on. One, a current, a current study uh, that we're doing on the impact of autonomous vehicles on the, uh, the U.S. auto insurance industry. Second thing is a study that I, I led with the Texas Transportation Institute Policy Research Center concerning the impact of, of, of AVs and connected vehicles on privacy. And the third thing is a RAND study that we did, autonomous vehicle technology, a guide for policymakers, which focused on data as one of the key issues. Hi, uh, my name is Gal Blacuz. I'm the Vice President of uh, Data Analytics and Monetization for the ZF Group. <clears throat> For those of you not familiar with ZF, it's one of the top automotive suppliers. We supply powertrain, advanced driver's assistance system, airbags, seat belts, uh, ch chassis parts, uh, a whole steering, a whole slew of uh, braking, a whole slew of uh, vehicle systems. And uh, as these systems become electronic, uh, and connected, uh, they generate a lot of data and a lot of valuable data that uh, can make the ownership experience better, uh, they can make the driving experience better, and uh, ultimately deliver a lot of uh, economic benefits uh, across the value chains from consumers to insurance companies, uh, maintenance, uh, et cetera. So, uh, we are uh, one of the leaders in understanding uh, what to do with that data and uh, how to monetize it in a way that uh, makes uh, sense for everyone and in particular the consumer. Okay, great. Uh, Ellen? I'm Ellen Partridge. I'm uh, the Policy and Strategy Director for the Shared Use Mobility Center. The uh, Shared Use Mobility Center is a, is a relatively young organization, about four years old. We, uh, <clears throat> we work to, uh, to uh, ensure a multimodal uh, transportation system that works for everybody. So we're really focused on, on equity and access and mobility. We, uh, we serve often as a kind of intermediary between transit agencies and private private providers. We have about 25 pilot projects that we're working on, uh, everything from um, band pools in Central Valley of California to uh, electric shared vehicles in uh, Los Angeles uh, to several automated vehicle pilots that are trying to get off the ground. Our interest in, in, uh, in data uh, in, in particular is with uh, the arrangements, the data agreements between transportation network companies, the Uber and Lyfts of the world, uh, and transit agencies. So there are lots of good, uh, good working relationships that can be uh, can be set up, but uh, the data agreements tend to be uh, a bit of a sticking point. So we have some uh, some uh, special perspective about what you uh, what you need to do to uh, to try to get those agreements uh, and what you need to consider. Great, and now I think we, we've solved right. the technology problem with well, Doug. Yeah, so we got the latest technology now. Um, so uh, I'm Doug Betts, I'm head of Global Auto for JD Power. Uh, previously spent uh, around 30 years working for auto companies, so uh, more experience in the OEM side of, of business. But uh, we're at JD Power, we're most well known for the studies that we do benchmarking the industry uh, on product quality as well as on service, you know, uh, at the point of sale or, or getting your vehicle serviced over the ownership cycle. 
uh, the, the research industry is being disrupted just really in advance of the auto industry being disrupted. And so one of our interests in uh, vehicle data is using the data coming out of the car to be able to become the research for how the owner of the car likes the vehicle. So we call that voice of the vehicle. And uh, if you can imagine the initial quality study that we have, which is a standard benchmark in the industry, and using the data and the way the owner is using the car to be the answers to those questions about how they how they like the car or what kinds of problems they're having with the car can be answered by what's actually happening in the car when they're using it. So we're pursuing that among other things. Okay, uh, great. And uh, so a couple of our panelists have done more uh, in-depth focused uh, research on uh, on this on this question about car data, and I, I guess I wanted, since you were last the first time, Doug, I wanted to give you the first first chance to talk in more in more detail about some of the things you right. worked on. Yeah, so so we have done some some research with uh, with consumers to understand their willingness to share their data in exchange for for whatever you know uh, coming out of their car, and and uh, as you might imagine, the the willingness is different depending on the demographics, but just for the basic question, are you willing to share your data uh, in exchange for the services that could be provided as a result of that? Uh, the, the low end are pre-boomers, you know, older, older drivers uh, are about 40%, still pretty high, 40% are willing to share their data in exchange for the services that can be provided as a result. Uh, when you get into Gen Z, which we were just talking about, I don't know what comes after Z because we're out of letters, but uh, it's 83% are willing to share their data in exchange for the services. Uh, when, you, when you ask, some of this I'll, I'll be a little less numerical, when you ask them if they're concerned about the security of the data, the answer is generally yes, but, but, it, but they, they assume that the industry will take care of it. You know, they, they list some things like end-to-end uh, -end encryption and anonymization and things like that, and they say, you know, I'm concerned about it, but I, you know, I don't want to forego the benefits, and I know the industry will, will, will take care of it for us, and we expect them to do that. Um, when you ask them if they want to pay for the services, uh, they, they generally say they're willing to pay. Again, it goes from, you know, pre-boomer saying 30% are willing to pay, uh, when you get to the younger uh, Gen Z and Gen Y, uh, it's 70%. Uh, they would prefer to pay for it as a part of buying the car, which is interesting. Uh, they, you know, subscription is actually third on the list. They would rather just buy the car and it's a part of the car. For those who don't want to pay for the service, it's largely because they think the services are not worth paying for. You know, and I think that's a that's an important message back to uh, our industry is that we, we, aren't, we aren't knocking it out of the park so far with the kinds of services that we're providing to the end, you know, to, to consumers from the car, especially in comparison to what phone, you know, phone providers are, are doing right now. So that's, uh, that's sort of the numbers that we have. Okay, um, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, Carlin, so you, you, you've completed two studies sort of on, on this topic and you're, you're sort of in the middle of a third one right. that's, uh, that's specific to insurance. But what, what, are, you know, what are some of the highlights from, from your two studies that were completed? Well, well sure, well, I, I'd like to pick up on what Doug said. And one of the, the anomalies that we found out in the Texas study was that the predominant number of people that we interviewed, and we interviewed over 35 stakeholders across the industry, um, said that in their view, consumers definitely were willing to exchange their data for a perceived benefit. But we also found that AAA did a study where if consumers were asked directly do you believe that you should have control over the data that comes from your automobile? They answered 79% agreed. 
then they were asked a second question, uh, do you think that there should be laws or regulations controlling how the data that comes from your car is used? Around 89% of people either agreed or strongly agreed. So there's a real duality here about what people will exchange, I guess, for convenience versus if you confront them directly about how their data is being used. Now, I'll, I'll bring up one other issue that's in our current study of the U.S. auto insurance industry, and that is a hotly contested topic around data, and that's the data between, the exchange of data between OEMs and insurance companies. The insurance companies say they need data from autonomous vehicles to be able to pay claims, but then also to build those risk profiles that are going to be important for pricing um, insurance for consumers. The OEMs, on the other hand, say they don't want to give the, the data because it has, it's proprietary or frankly contains some secret sauce. So those are a couple of things we've seen in our studies. Yeah, and uh, I, w I would imagine we should watch that space. But <laughs> right. That's like a pretty big question that's got to right. get worked out. Um, so I, 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 I still want to try to, um, to draw this out a little bit more and, and get a better sense of how far along this transportation economy is already and who's already using data and how and where, where are people making money. And um, Gal, I, I wonder if that's, that's a, a good place for you to, sure. to jump in. Yeah, happy to. Um, thanks, Jeff. So I want you to kind of understand a distinction that, that we make. I, I think there's really two types of data. There's what I would call pure consumer data, which is essentially, think about location. Like, where are you at what point in time? That's, that's potentially, I would say, more personal information. And then uh, there is what I would call uh, technical information. So for example, getting a time series signal or statistics from a chassis part or from your brakes or from your engine or from your transmission. And I think that um, as we really get into monetization and what can be done with the data, uh, I, we need to, to recognize the difference uh, between those because when it comes to this uh, deep technical data, um, without getting into details, there are a lot of opportunities and I think the willingness uh, of consumers ultimately, I, I personally believe, uh, is great around the benefit of that data. I think the sensitivity around personal data, like location, that's, that's a different story, right? So I think that as, as the field evolves, I think the understanding that, that vehicle data is not homogeneous, okay? It's really split into, uh, into different categories, and, and I think that um, where we see the greatest uh, monetization opportunities is actually in, in the technical data. That's very much in the realm. Of, uh, of the auto industry. I think that uh, you know, when it comes to the consumer data, that's where we run into you know, the issues with the phone and comparing to the phone and all that stuff. So I think that uh, yes, there are great opportunities out there, but we need to approach it in a segmented way. Okay, and, um, and we should say this isn't all just about cars. So in, there's this larger transportation ecosystem that's uh, developing. And we have things like uh, not only car sharing and ride hailing, but um, you know, in Washington where I'm from and, and even in Detroit, I was walking around yesterday and seeing um, these new electric scooters that, that are kind of taking over the streets. And we have bike sharing. So Ellen, um, you know, how, how far along are those things, and, and how do you, how do you see it developing, and what are what are the, the the consumer data questions that need to be asked? So I think the the uh, the initial questions are just you know how much how much are they being used? What's the origin and, and destination? We're still at, at, at that level of, of trying to get that information uh, and setting setting those parameters. I mean the 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 growth of some of these new modes is just extraordinary. So 
Austin, where I, uh, where I was recently, uh, has an unlimited number of, of scooters. And five months after those scooters were introduced, they had 300,000 rides a month. And that was 10% of the rides that were on the public transit system. So just a massive, massive uh, growth curve there. Uh, and so just really trying to understand, you know, where are, they, where are they left? What kind of information does the city need in order to be able to, uh, to, to figure out, you know, where, where, are the, where are the resting spots for those at night? Are they not being included in some areas of the, of the city? So those are the kinds of things that uh, the transit agency in the city would like, would like to have. Um, it's, it's still a fairly virgin area for figuring out what kinds of agreements uh, we want to have. I'm more familiar with the, uh, the kinds of agreements that we've been working out with uh, transportation network companies. Um, and uh, they're, they're some of the hardest parts of coming to an agreement between a transit agency and a, and a TNC for providing uh, first mile, last mile service or providing paratransit service. Uh, and it, it, uh, the kind, I, mean, I think the first thing that you really need to focus on uh, is what, what do you want to use the data for? So for a city, are they trying to you know, figure out where there are, are traffic spots or how to improve operations? Um, do they have the capacity to store the data, to analyze it, and to use it? Uh, because I think nothing uh, irritates a, a private company more than you know, just sending over you know, terabytes of data that, that just sit there. So figuring out you know, what do you want, actually want to use that information for is the, uh, is the first question. And then, then looking at the kinds of options that, that you have of an agreement with the company or perhaps using a, a third party uh, repository to hold the data. Research institutions are starting to develop that kind, of, that kind of capacity. So I think it's like those are the steps that we have to get to before we can figure out you know, how much uh, uh, opportunity for monetization is there, is there, is there really. The, uh, there are two, two parts of the monetization, though, of course. So one is potentially getting revenue, uh, and the other is reducing costs by better, uh, better operations. So both of those things need to be, uh, need to be looked at. But again, the, the legal and governance standards for that are, uh, are slowly evolving, and I think will not be the same in all places. Yeah, and I, I mean, it, when I think about like what happened with uh, what, what is happening with scooters now and what happened with um, kind of dockless bike sharing even uh, like a year ago. So a year ago in Washington, or maybe a year and a half ago, um, like these thousands and thousands of uh, dockless bikes showed up. And, and, the, and the data, and luckily we had data about them and, and it showed that a lot of people were using those dockless bikes who hadn't used the, the older dock, docking bike share system uh, and it was a, it was a different demographic they were going to different parts of the city right. um, but they were also like uh, showing up in uh, like the woods at night <laughs> like, <laughs> like people, and, and they were also uh, like there was this big backlash against them like uh, people resented that the, they were being parked on the sidewalk or in front of their building or in, in front of somebody else's driveway in my neighborhood um, so th th that kind of system, you can't really tell like how it's filling in the gaps or how it's working without without the data. Right, and uh, you know, as quickly as some of those <coughs> excuse me, dockless companies came in, uh, just as quickly they uh, they left. So yeah. the, the, for the public agencies to keep up with uh, the kinds of data uh, needs and demands that they have is uh, takes some effort. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm gonna um, I'm gonna ask one more question. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, weave in some of the questions we're, we're already getting from the audience. So uh, um, I'm, I'm in, with this question, I'm attempting to um, get at uh, what, what are some potential controversies. Uh, and uh, and let, let's just get it out in the open. So you know, over the past few years, we've been uh, reminded that there are actually risks uh, to the big data world. So there, uh, there's consumer data breaches at banks, uh, you know, almost uh, like on a monthly basis. Uh, there was the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. There's ransomware. Um, there, are, there are all these uh, dangers that we didn't even think about a few years ago. So how, how has this affected uh, consumers' willingness to share their car data? And, and are there any lessons for the auto industry? So 
Doug? I mean, that seems like your research seems like the, the answer might be no. I mean, I think, you know, I don't, again, I won't, I won't quote the numbers, but I, I think the answer is the genie's out of the bottle with our phone already, and uh, consumers don't see. In some ways, the car is different. But in, gen in general, I mean, realistically, the car data is not different. I was, I was talking to a, a couple of members of the group before we came out here. You know, the, the only way the car is different in, in probably a lot of people's in the back of their mind is most people speed in the car and most people, you know, blast through a, a yellow light occasionally or roll through a stop sign. In the back of your mind, you might be thinking, you know, is, is that going to catch up with me? I know I would never plug in one of those uh, you know, devices for my insurance because of the way I drive, I'm assuming that my insurance would be canceled. But, <laughs> but other than that, you know, if you ask about sharing your vehicle data, every, most people are gonna say, I'm already sharing tons and tons of data, more so than what my vehicle knows by, by my phone. So it's not, a, it's not a new decision, it's a bridge that's already been crossed. Um. So Charles, what what about that? <laughs> is that is that Blackberry's view? Yeah. Or, and I also wonder, like you're you're from Canada, right? And, and these things might um, play out a little a little differently there. Yeah, well, we definitely stop at every stop sign and don't yeah, run. Yeah. And, and <laughs> polite driving. Yeah, polite. We apologize a lot. No, uh, you know what? I I think we're we're on the cusp in the automotive space. An explosion that happened in the in the mobile space. Like, how many of you would have predicted there would be hundreds of thousands of applications on the device you use for making phone calls? That happened when it got connected. Um, cars are being connected, like it's here. It's coming fast, and the use cases we can't even imagine. So we have near infinite bandwidth of the CPU, or near infinite network bandwidth, and near infinite CPU relative to the past. And with that will come services and data uh, that we can't imagine. And so the, the ability to protect that data, to, you know, there's, there's a, a small awareness role going through society with some of the things mentioned about data awareness. I, I believe that companies need to be very clear about what data they're collecting and why. And, and we, we need to be able to make the choice as to whether or not we want to, we don't want to be tricked. Because right now, every app that you have is probably collecting information you're not aware of, your location, your camera, your microphone. And, and eventually, things will happen that you're not happy with because you, your, your identity has been compromised. So I think we need to be, I have a voice of caution. We need to be very careful about what checks and balances we put in place with the data we're, collection, we're collecting to make sure that we're uh, being responsible. GDPR sent a shockwave of awareness through the industry. Um, I, I just think as we move forward with the data collect with the data collection, we need to be very careful. There's going to be a lot of data. That data will be mined using machine learning to gain, to gain insights. Those insights will be useful uh, for people that are providing services. So I, I think we need to be we need to go carefully into this future. And I think there's lots of good things that can happen, but. It is all based on data, and data is the new currency for uh, you know for this platform. Okay. Any, anybody else want to weigh in on that one? Well, I'll just mention that uh, one of the potential dark sides is that consumers feel that there are no standards and that they are being surveilled. So it's a surveillance issue, which in the very worst case could potentially slow deployment if consumers are worried about autonomous vehicles for that reason. So what we really need is, is consumers to feel confident that their data is being handled in a way that is standardized and that they understand. So we, we don't have a potential slowing of deployment or even, the very worst case, a market failure because of a, of a misunderstanding or concern about how data is being used. Jeff, Jeff, if I could just, it's a little sure. bit back to what Gail talked about and also this. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, auto, the auto industry is a very cautious industry and I, I spent most of my career there. I spent a couple of years at Apple and I was able to 
from those two experiences compare the difference in cautiousness for the auto industry versus cautiousness for a company like Apple, and not necessarily around security because they're on record of, or in privacy, they're on record of being really strong uh, for that, but um, this issue of standardizing the data so that it can be useful. Uh, our, our business, I'm not a part of it, but our J.D. Power is also involved in banking and insurance, so we we're really have a, a whole group that works with insurance companies, and there's this issue where car companies have the data, but they're nervous about sharing it. Insurance companies would like to have the data so that they can provide better services to their customers and reduce costs. For example, if they had data from cars, when they crashed, they would know the crash happened. They could even uh, know exactly what's wrong with that car based on the accelerometer data from the car and go ahead, set up a body shop, have the parts ordered, and be ready to fix it the next day, theoretically. And they would like to be able to do that, but they have to get the data from the OEMs mm -hmm. in a standardized way. And the OEMs, aren't. there's nobody to work together to make that mm -hmm. standard format for the data and That's at right. the same time could take care of privacy issues and all mm -hmm. of the other things that make OEMs mm -hmm. concerned about sharing the data in the first place mm -hmm. so that it could be useful. That that would be a benefit to society, right? That you mm -hmm. would immediately be able to know what's wrong with the car, fix it. You'd, you'd know if somebody was likely injured or not. You could call you know, for help. All, lots and lots of benefits are available, but we, we just we need to figure out how to get past this because we've sort of been frozen We've been talking, as long as I've been in the auto industry, like 15 years, when all of this kind of became available, us engineers all got really excited and we went in and had meetings and we drew on whiteboards all the great stuff that we were gonna do, and it just hasn't happened because we've been paralyzed with, you know, who's gonna do it and who and when and how and how it's gonna be monetized and who's gonna get paid and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yep. I guess I'd like to maybe add uh, a global perspective on this. So, so if you look at uh, what's going on in Europe, uh, there's something called GDPR, which is uh, a, a pretty stringent regulation on, uh, on the use of data, and that, uh, that transcends auto, okay? And, and I think that is actually useful because it gives a framework to take out a lot of the risk, um, you know, from the point of view of, of the car companies. And, and I fully agree with, uh, with Doug's point of view that because the car companies are hyper-cautious, there will be, especially in the U.S., a risk of underutilizing uh, the data. And another thing that's happening in Europe, uh, there's something uh, called Nevada or neutral server, which is basically a movement to assure that the OEMs don't have a cartel through control of the vehicle data. Because you could imagine that if you're a car company and you have access to the data, you can spin up an insurance company that could outcompete any other insurance company service, uh, maintenance and repair services that would outcompete anybody else. So they, uh, the industry there is self-regulating against that. And then you have countries like China where the government is probably gonna centralize the data in one form or another. And then you have the US which is kinda stuck in the middle, right? So I think uh, to me it's going to be interesting uh, the next uh, few years to see, you know, wh which models really take off. And if I could just jump in, we found out through our interviews from our current research about the, the impact of AVs on the uh, U.S. auto industry that there has just been a voluntary uh, platform established in the U.K. back in December that will allow OEMs and insurance companies to exchange information. That's just now being worked out, but that's an interesting model. Okay. I, I, I do wonder whether there's a kind of countervailing uh, force too. So in, in Europe also there is this you know, right to be forgotten where you can have data erased. So even though this new generation is, uh, is saying, you know, we'll exchange, you know, privacy for uh, for services I think it's also that that same generation that is pushing for this you know right to be right to be forgotten so you know all of that dancing on tabletops you know <laughs> get that out of there well th there's an interesting case study um, and uh, Gal, you meant you, you use the word cartel uh, and uh, I was in a similar discussion like this uh, at the Washington Auto Show last week and and the, the, the car data issue was raised in terms of 
uh, right to repair. Uh, so currently, if something goes wrong with your car, you can take it to an independent mechanic as well as the dealer. And the independent mechanic generally has a tool uh, to plug into the OBD port. Um, but some cars don't have o OBD ports anymore. Tes Teslas don't have OBD ports because they don't have emissions. So they, they, you know, there is no need for that kind of port. And more and more auto companies are creating the, the, this uh, stream of uh, mechanical information that's going back to the, the auto company. And uh, the independent repair shops are worried that uh, the auto companies are going to become cartels and they're, and they're going to charge uh, prohibitive uh, amounts of money for that data so that people will have to take their cars to dealers for a more expensive service. Uh, does anybody want to weigh in on whether that is a uh, reasonable uh, thing that consumers should worry about? Or, or, or respond to that general, general well, uh, trend in, in any way. Well, this is actually something we've been asking people about in our current research about the U.S. auto industry. And it does appear that mom and pop body shops may be on the way out. But the reason that we found out in our research is because of the sensors and the calibration and the very sophisticated work that is going to need to be done on the, the automobiles. And in fact, one of the reasons that we found that the fleet model of deployment for autonomous vehicles might be the most favored one, the one that we'll see the soonest, is because of maintenance. Because it's so important to keep the calibration and the, the software up to date, and so maintenance is a very, very important uh, aspect of safety of autonomous vehicles. And that is one of, the, for particularly one of the reasons that we might see the small auto body shops uh, not being able to handle it. Actually, I, there's, there's one thing I'll add, I'd, I'd like to add to that, I think that's a really good point. When we, when we talk about data, there's personal data, then you may or may not be comfortable with it being tracked. But, but uh, there's also sensor data, and that sensor data, if it's used as part of an autonomous or a driver assist, if, if that's somehow compromised, that, that now becomes an attack surface. So it's not just the, your personal data or the vehicle telemetry data, but the ability to falsify sensor data uh, becomes an attack surface that we need to be aware of when the car becomes connected. And then we, when we have thousands of sensors, the potential of the supply chain to make sure that there hasn't been a compromise is something that needs to be very carefully looked at. So it's not just your data, it's the ability to falsify any data uh, that, that needs to be looked at in this, in this environment. And there's lots of ways we can do that, but we, just, we need to make sure that, that every bit of data that we're using for critical systems uh, can be somehow authenticated and trusted. So trust is something in data that we need to build. And this is why I think we have lots of great safety in the automobile industry, but security and cybersecurity is something that I, I believe we need standards and, and, and we need the ability for consumers to be able to feel that this is more secure and therefore more safe and as part of the buying decision. So, so I, I think you know, consumer reports doing consumer education on what, how secure things are I think is really good and there's some emerging best practices, but what we really need is, is we need more standards where we can certify that something is secure uh, and that your data is protected. So whether or not you can use the data is, a, is one question, but to make sure the data that's there is protected from a security point of view, I, th I think is also uh, important for this industry to be uh, uh, controlled in a, in a desirable way. Okay, and here, here's an interesting related question from the audience. Uh, what are the ethical implications of withholding road safety data from road owners when it places CAV owners at risk? So the, 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 this question comes up in, in my office in uh, Consumer Reports in Washington. We have uh, policy experts 
uh, who, who work on auto safety issues. And the, um, there, anytime data comes up, they're, they're very eager, right? And because there is this, this idea that this underlying, like all of this normal stuff that uh, the connected cars uh, and cars uh, equipped with sensors uh, are gonna generate is gonna be just so enormously valuable to, to researchers and figuring out um, you know, more intelligent regulations. And, but that doesn't, it, it may not work if people opt out, right? If, if people refuse to, sh to share their car data. Is that, uh, yeah, that, I, that I mean, your, it sounds like that, you're interested. That's, that's true. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think in, in, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, a simple question that you have to answer and have a philosophy behind to start with, which is who owns the data coming from your car? Who owns the data coming from the car you're riding in? Maybe it's not your car. Um, and, you know, we have, to, we have to have an answer for that. And, you know, in, in this country, who owns the data that's coming from your car that you bought? I, I don't see it ever ending up being anything but you own the data. You can decide to share it with different entities, but uh, where in, in another country that the answer to that may be different. But, um, you know, and, and the fact that you withholding the data, maybe it could have helped somebody who's a half a mile behind you, um, but you, you didn't share the data. I think in this country, that's, you know, that's too bad, right? I mean, that's just the way we are. Uh, but it is a question that you know that will be debated when when that time comes. Most of the autonomous vehicle development that's happening now is is on the basis, as I understand it, of that vehicle has sensors and it's looking at the world and it's deciding what to do. It may be communicating with the cloud to get advice on what to do, but everything it knows is based on the sensors that are on that car. So it's not you know they're not so far developing the notion, and I've had some industry people tell me they don't ever think car to car is ever going to happen. It's just you know, nobody's doing anything with it, but they, they may be right or they may be wrong, but that's where we're sort of at right now. Well, the, the, there's, a, there's, there, there's, a, there's an early version of car to car. If we look at Google Maps, pe people tend to, to turn on location service and you know, Google Maps in ways, and in return, they get optimal routes. Uh, delivered to them, so it's not exactly car to car, but it's uh, uh, you know it's an early indication of shared data being better for all. And I think most people keep location services on, even though they could turn it off uh, and and potentially get the benefit and optimal route without turning on location services. People tend to opt in because there's a greater good. I've danced around the ethical side of this <laughs> in terms of you know that there's a bad thing on the road yeah. and you don't report it. I believe it at this point it's an opt-in basis and the greater good prevails. Uh, I, I think it needs to be easy to uh, communicate that information and people should be aware that they're doing it, but and uh, then the vehicle to vehicle becomes much more uh, a vehicle to grid and vehicle to vehicle becomes much more effective to the greater good. Ellen, did you want to Sorry, add something? It looked, it uh, well, like it's you just, did. And I, I think that uh, that the way that vehicles, so car, car to car data, that that probably does have that that element of, you know, it's mine and I don't necessarily have to share it. But the the data about how you know scooters are being used, uh, about how some of these other new modes are being used, uh, I think is seen as more of a public kind of kind of data, uh, and that that you 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 can't opt out. When you're when you're taking your scooter, it's like the it's the company that's deciding, figuring out what kind of arrangement they have with the uh, with the, the city. And I think there, there's other other kinds of data from uh, from sensors on the on the on the highway. So uh, one state I saw has uh, has sensors on the highway that uh, can tell you how much how much fog there is, and so that information is conveyed to uh, to motorists. Um, and there was a question of you know, well, could they then sell that data to private weather companies so they can make better weather predictions? 
and I think you know that might be that might be fine, <laughs> but uh, I don't think that you would want to have a situation where you would sell that fog data to to a motorist. So so part of it, so part of it is you know like who owns it and who has what kind of what kind of responsibility, but it's not all just individual kind of yeah. ownership. And and there are definitely uh, I think Gal, Gal said before it's like there are different uh, layer or different categories of data. Mm -hmm. And there's some very, very highly personal data, like location information. Right. And then there's some uh, more general data that could, could feed into the cloud to help improve safety or, or performance of like all, all uh, units of a certain make and model. Um, but you know, as I've talked to some companies about car data, one of the solutions that, it, that is often raised is uh, well, we, we, we make the data anonymous. So we, we scoop the data off of, of all, all the cars and we run it through our algorithms so there is no personally identifying uh, information uh, available and, that, and that's the solution for people's privacy. And, and that does sound good. That sounds, in theory, like that should solve the problem. Uh, but uh, we were talking backstage and um, Carlin, you, you, you said, um, <laughs> you said that that just doesn't work from 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 your research. All right. Although when we interviewed people uh, in the Texas study, we asked we asked all stakeholders, and uh, what do you think about data anonymization? Is that the answer to protecting personally identifiable information? And some people said, why yes, it is. But then many other experts said, absolutely not. And at the time we were doing the research, there was a MIT study that came out that showed that if you had just four pieces of data, spatial or location data, and they did this with financial data, that you could identify who that person was without any other kinds of identification. 90% of people could be identified. Now, if you have a data set and then you can cross it with another data set, you can, with you know almost complete accuracy, identify who that individual is, as long as you have some of those time or location uh, data uh, points. So I think that Anonymization is not the panacea. Does, does I'd any, ask Charles yeah, to weigh in on that. Yeah, 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 no, I, I, I definitely don't want to take a contrarian view here. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the more data sources we have, and the ability, you know, our machine learning and our data analytics capability, the ability to mine across that large set of data to, to pull the signal out of personal information is, it is, is it exactly as you had mentioned. It's, uh, it's very hard to be anonymous. You need very little personal information to, to tie a data stream and get personal information out of someone. So I, I think we need to be very cautious about the, uh, the personal information uh, claim uh, given the, the amount of pattern that you can find in a large number of data sources. The best way to prevent data leakage is to not send it. So being careful about any, any information, uh, having great controls over sharing personal information, I think needs to be the first, the first level of defense, but also being very open that it's not as anonymous as you think, I think as Carolyn has stated is, uh, is also my view. And I, I, you know, I agree with what both of you have said, um, and I, I'm, a, I'm a, a little bit more familiar with the GDPR rules because of a project that we've been working on over there. And they also have a requirement for aggregation, a certain level of aggregation of data um, that, that should help. Uh, at the same time, I think the, the real solution is um, the, pen, you know, the penalties for using it in a way that is you know, legislated. You, you're, if there are laws that say, regardless of we have certain rules about how you collect the data and how you aggregate it and things like that, with the objective of of uh, protecting privacy. If on top of that, there are laws that say 
you're not allowed to use it for certain purposes to a large extent that you know, that creates a chilling effect. I can tell you in Europe, it's a very chilling effect where companies are not even doing things that they are that they could do because they're, they, they just don't want to take the risk. Um, you know, that, that really is the, to me, is the only solution to this is that the penalties for using it in the wrong way are so severe. It doesn't mean that criminals won't mm -hmm. use it in the wrong way, but I, I don't, you know, we, we've been, We've been chasing after criminals for our, our whole existence. You know, they're, they're out there, it's the cops and the robbers, and, and that, that won't stop uh, because of the new technology. It's going to continue, and, and we'll have to continue to chase them, but that's about it. Yeah, I, I think we need to, again, have a, <clears throat> a finer lens on this. We could look at it from the point of view of use cases. So for example, if I have whatever specific model vehicle and data about my engine or a particular vehicle system is streamed in a way that's anonymized to just saying the model of the vehicle, that is not that useful from the point of view of, of personalization. So I think the, it's a, there's a use case lens. Um, I think also considering what, what you said earlier, um, Doug, about uh, comparing it to a phone, right? Because you know you can go into Google and it will show you where you've been for the last six months, right? It's shocking. I'm, I'm sure you've all played with that and seen it. So, and, and you ask yourself, well, how does Google solve this problem? Well, they solve it through an end user agreement, which in some countries could be legal, in some countries uh, should be not, it will not. So, I think that uh, the economic benefit is so great that that people are going to take this big problem and they're going to chop it up into little pieces and go after mm -hmm. each and every one the way that's appropriate for it. You know, I guess I would just I would just say in, in response to the comment about penalties for for use that with my uh, with my lawyer's hat on, I think that would be hard to hard to prove. Uh, and so I think that the uh, the, the penalties for collecting are also really, really important. So uh, the GDPR has come up uh, in our discussion, and we, we've got some interest in that uh, from our audience. Um, so I, I just wonder if, so the, there, there is the GDPR, which is this uh, general privacy law in Europe. Uh, California has, has passed its own privacy law. Um, I, I guess the, the, the first part of the question is, do we, do we see a need for uh, some sort of national U.S. privacy law? And then the, the, maybe the related question is, uh, are these laws, um, because the, the auto industry is a global industry, are these laws already having an effect? Are, are companies already uh, in the general U.S. market, are, the, are they already uh, designing their products with, with these laws in mind. Mm, so, any, anyone want to go first? Well, I, um, I'll, I won't speak on the U.S. laws. I'll take. <laughs> I'll put the Canadian hat on. But 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 I, I will say, GDPR has had a very interesting. It's had a couple of very interesting effects on society. It's it's raised a lot of awareness for consumers about uh, uh, information that's being collected, and I think it's raised a lot of uh, awareness for connected devices and connected products to, to actually look at themselves and reflect what information am I collecting and, and getting good uh, data hygiene uh, in place. So I think GDPR has been fantastic for that. And one of the, the sub-aspects of GDPR that I really like is that the data has to time out. So if you are collecting personal, inf personal information, you need to dem demonstrably prove that uh, that, that you're not can keeping it forever, and and there's big fines if you violate this. So so I, I think from a penalty point of view and an awareness point of view, it's played an important card. And I think it it, it does definitely apply in the U.S. But I'll I'll that, that's my uh, quick feedback on that question. Well, in the Texas study, we looked a lot at the U.S. framework for privacy protection, and the bottom line, at least now, is that privacy protections in the U.S. are very siloed. They 
uh, the Congress has looked at specifically how to pr protect certain stakeholders against uh, the claims of other stakeholders in the areas of, for example, financial information or health uh, and medical related information with HIPAA or the information about what you, you get from uh, a cable company. So there, and, and also the protection of children with COPPA. So there's, these are very siloed protections. We do not have the kind of broad uh, privacy protections that, that you have in Europe, for example. And, and um, a quick follow up for Doug. So it, in one of our planning calls, the, the, this came up. And you made a comment, and I, I'm, I might, as a, as a journalist, I might be uh, summarizing it totally wrong, uh, and, and feel free to uh, correct me, but um, isn't there a possibility that um, because the U.S. is a different framework, uh, that, that um, different products might evolve differently in the U.S. if, if, if there's a more open uh, way to deal with consumer data privacy than, than the European Yeah, model. I mean, I, I think there's the, you know, I think we've already talked about a little bit that there, there certainly is a big difference between what's happening in China and what's happening in Europe uh, are probably the, are the two extremes. And the U.S. is still in flux, but if we take China, for example, they, as a, as a nation are going to be able to take huge advantage of the opportunities to optimize things because they are collecting data on everything and everyone and every IOT device and, and uh, every transaction. And, and let's, let's assume all of that is being used to make things go more smoothly, right? To be more efficient. Uh, I mean, myself, I, the, the, the last time I flew to China, it was a new law, I guess, and I got, I got off the plane and they funneled me over and they took my fingerprints and my face and my eyes. And I didn't have a choice, or I, I guess I could have hidden in the, under my seat or something and I got off the airplane. Oh. So now they have that, presumably it's gonna be some kind of a benefit to somebody, hopefully mostly me, the next time I go. Um, but they've got that on everybody and everything, and they can run their society efficiently. Um, on the other hand, Europe is going to suffer because of GDPR. They're not going to be able to do a lot of the things, certainly that China will be able to do, or even the things that we're able to do here because of GDPR. And you know, and we, we still haven't decided. I, I think we are, a, we are the most capitalistic, society on the planet and you know I would argue that uh, consumers will punish the companies that misuse their their information and that's already happening I mean I, I watch CNBC every morning and Facebook gets dragged through the mud every single day about their past practices and uh, you know and w whether that changes their tactics or not I don't know but it, it seems like it should have some effect on them so that certainly, that's, a, that's what's happening for us, right? Is it's the capitalism at work and saying, people don't like it, they're gonna stop buying things from you. Um, but we haven't decided to legislate it. I'm, I'm, nerv I'm always nervous when you say, hey, let's get the government involved and they'll fix this because they almost always goof it up. So, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily calling for that because I think they'll do something that won't make any sense and could do more harm than good, that frequently happens. Uh, so, but whether we, we sit and wait for capitalism to continue to protect us, or you know, we watch China and we watch Europe and, and, and get a little wiser and decide what we should do, I don't know, those are my thoughts. Okay. Um, so we, we talked earlier about one possible solution being uh, anonymizing certain types of data. Uh, another solution that frequently comes up when you talk about data and privacy is uh, clear, disco clear disclosure when the, when the data is being collected and what it's being used for. 
And uh, I think there's a, a feeling that um, a lot of card data is being collected right now, and the, the opt-in is when you buy the car. Uh, when you buy the car, you get um, a stack of documents, and one of these documents may be like you're, you're agreeing to allow the auto company to collect the car data. Um, I, that, you know, from, from our work uh, at Consumer Reports on the digital standard, that doesn't seem sufficient. Um, but what, what, you know, it, it's hard to know like what, what that would look like. So, I mean, I, I can envision if, if you get a new app on your car, maybe uh, there's some sort of uh, disclosure like the first time you use the app. But uh, do you, do you, does the panel feel like that this is a solvable problem, that there are uh, responsible ways to uh, disclose and make consumers aware of data like as it's being collected? Well, let me just give you a, a little bit of information from another RAND study we did concerning end user agreements for mobile apps on smartphones. One of the things we found out was that in a review of over 500 end, end user agreements, they were all written at a level that required at least two years of college <laughs> to fully understand those end user agreements. So. I would argue that whatever disclosure, it's not just disclosure, but what is the type of disclosure and how understandable is that disclosure? Okay. Um, so well, I, would, I would just certainly yep. chime in there to say that I, I think that, that maybe uh, those kinds of agreements may be someplace where, uh, where a, a federal law would be helpful because the last time I opened one up, it was 54 pages long. And, you know, I, I, yeah. I just think it's just, it's really just ludicrous to think that, that you know, more than, I don't know, one out of 10,000 people reads them. I don't know, do you read them? <laughs> no, I, I was just thinking to ask the audience, has anybody ever read one? Yeah. I, I, honestly, I never have, you know. I mean, you're, you get the app and you want to use it, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, one other comment on the, on the subject, and it's something that I've just noticed. Uh, at, at, in my past experience, we would put in a, a document at the time you buy the car. It's in the stack of things you know, that you're signing. You just want to get the keys and get out of there. Uh, and that was it one time, it's, but it's on the record. You said you, you'd share your data. I've noticed now a car that I recently got that the car asks me that question. So I'm turning it on and off on the car as a part of the, yeah. like setting up the system. And then that same car, every time I start the car, the screen comes up and says this vehicle is sharing data hmm. uh, to help you know with all these good things about what it's doing for me but uh, if I want to change that it tells me where to go to change it so you know to me that seems like the right approach I mean you there were nav systems when they first came out that came up and said basically I'll paraphrase don't trust this or you might run into a building or something yeah. And you had to say yes, and you know that was the yeah. legal department gone too far. Uh, people really got outraged with having to say yes every single time. But I think something not that's noticeable and that you know occasionally you may say, oh yeah, this is sharing data. You know, is probably the right the right place to be. Okay, I, I, I think that there's just just one point. I, I think there's more consumer awareness to ask these questions. I think there is a lot of data that's collected for the efficient running of the automobile. And, and I think at its core, the data needs to be disclosed, why it's being collected, so users are informed. Um, but let's face it, we're gonna have high bandwidth connections to these cars. Mm -hmm. New services will be coming. And the other thing that we haven't really talked about here is the identity of the driver or the, the consumer of the data or the provider of the data uh, can change. So driver A could have a different profile from driver B. And, and so that information gets tied to a person. And I think whether you consent once or whether you read these agreements, uh, I, I think it becomes a little more tailored with car shares or mm -hmm. um, you know, t uh, services that you turn on and off uh, you know, in future automobile uh, service applications. With the new bandwidth, services will fall in. And I think the data being collected in those services at minimum should be dis disclosed. I think that's the responsibility of the data collector. I, I want to comment on that. I, I, I guess our, you need to think that the future may, may actually be different 
where cars are going to have identities separate from people. So we, for example, have a product we call Car eWallet, <coughs> which is a <coughs> blockchain-based identity for a vehicle. Because you can imagine if you have an autonomous vehicle, it drops you off in a restaurant and it wants to go park. Now it's got to pay, right? So <laughs> how does it do that? So we actually have a product in that space called Car eWallet that gives a vehicle a blockchain-based identity, and then that relationship between the people and the cars, that's a, a fascinating new realm. Mm. That's interesting. Very interesting. Um, so we, we just have a few minutes left, and I want to get through a, a couple more of our audience questions. Uh, so one is, uh, are any automakers creating privacy programs that are building trust already instead of just selling data. Anyone? <laughs> not, not that we know of. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know I, I would think all automobile makers would, would feel that they're providing trust. So, yeah. so I think that's not, that's not taken lightly, but I think it's hard to do well. So uh, I I'm, 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 I'm don't think anyone would put up their hand and say no. <laughs> Our system can't be trusted. Well, I, you so know, like we talked continue. about earlier, I think the automakers are being exceedingly cautious, which is their is their nature, and, and so I don't think anybody is is violating a trust anyway. Whether I don't know whether what the what their owners think about that, but I, yeah. I don't see that. Okay, I definitely wanted to ask this question because this is a quintessentially SAE question, <laughs> uh, and this is to Gall. Um, regarding Gall's comment on monetizing tech infos, how would tier one suppliers benefit from that rather than just OEMs? <laughs> okay. So, when you think about that, if you're a tier one and, and you have a, a vehicle system and you sell it to multiple OEMs, if you understand the data coming off of your system, you're in a much better position to help monetize that data as opposed to every OEM figuring out that data separately and trying to monetize it. So I think that, uh, in fact, one of the greater monetization opportunities for the technical data, I'm not talking about the consumer data, for the technical data is actually, is actually with tier ones, okay? Again, because we have the scale of the same system going into uh, multiple OEMs and multiple vehicles. Okay, and then um, here's here's one final uh, audience question, and this this one gets to um, the difference between the present and the future. Uh, there will be, or will there be, a difference between autonomous and privately owned vehicle data, and could you elaborate on the use cases? Anyone? Well, one, perhaps the person who asked the question was thinking about vehicles that are owned in a fleet situation. And I think that is really an interesting topic. That's something we haven't really touched on. And remember, with, with fleet ownership, instead of individual ownership of a single uh, automobile, you might have different entities. For example, you could have the OEM. The OEM may lease or sell uh, autonomous vehicles to an owner. Maybe it's a, a, a grocery store chain that has decided to deliver groceries autonomously. So they're the owner. But then there could be an operator who operates the fleet and then there could be yet another entity, the maintenance company. I mentioned earlier how important maintenance is to those fleets. So think about that. You have a whole chain there, and how will the, the use of data and the, the uh, control over data operate in that situation? So uh, I think that fleet data and how it's going to be used is going to be very different than on the one-to-one -one, uh, uh, ownership of an autonomous vehicle, which may not be happening for quite some time. Okay, um, so I think that that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. 
Uh, oh, wait. Did, did anyone else? We, we have 28 seconds left. So. Well, I, you know, I would just add that it's apparent, it, it appears that capitalism is counting on the fleets owning the data because that's why Uber and Lyft have the valuation that they have. It's not yeah. because the business model generates profit. So they're counting on that data. Okay. And, and with that, I think uh, the, the session is a wrap. And, but before we go, please uh, join me in uh, thanking our panelists for, for all of the, sure. the great comments today.